Hello, everyone. Hello. So we've both picked out an episode each. Today I've picked season two, eleven, episode eleven, Contagion. Indeed. And Annalise is one we're going to reveal in our next episode. Yes, so you're going to have to wait. If you would like to watch along, please get your timestamp to zero on Netflix or your DVD or whatever, and press play at the sound of the now. Now. So, um... This definitely isn't the fourth time we're trying to make uh, yeah, this to yeah. work. It, yeah. <laughs> so, the classic um, episode of TNG, season two, it's probably one of the first really solid standalone episodes of The Next Generation yes. for me. Yes. There aren't too many solid episodes with uh, that still have Pipey on the uniforms. <laughs> yeah. I mean, season two is generally better. We've lost skirts by this point, though, right? Yes, I think that we don't have any weird togas anymore, but yeah. still everybody is in those back-breaking uniforms. Apparently the problem they had was that because they were sort of zip-up at the back, mm. they were constantly, all day, they were constantly stretching and pulling on your shoulders, oh. pulling your shoulders down. So, yeah, they weren't great for that. Um, but they, def they definitely got a lot better... Um, after that, uh, I mean, the, the season three redesign with the slightly larger collar looked looked better. Yeah. Oh, I think by season three the look was definitely they'd figured it out. Yeah. But we talked about that in our last episode. I think. We did. We did. Oh, hello. So you know, classic. Have your sister ship look just the same and use the same <laughs> set, but change a few things. Um, and you get to use the same model. In fact, I don't even know if they relabeled. Um, they just shot it from an angle where you couldn't see the registry number or something. You know? Relabeling sounds like a lot of work. They they have done it. Like you do see, I think in the original series they relabeled the Enterprise model and shot it again and again for the is it the Ultimate Computer episode yes. where there's four con uh, Constitution classes and there's one called the York Town. Oh, okay, yeah. There's one called Excalibur and stuff. So. I feel like what what's happening to the Yamato is like what was happening to our mm. Netflix app. <laughs> maybe maybe our computer's been infected by by a weird virus. Oh, good. Uh, so yeah, it's a th it's a thriller mm. episode. It's kind of got a plot that gradually gets revealed. You can tell that the captain of the Yamato is wearing someone else's uniform because of how ill fitting it is. Oh, that's a yeah, that's a very standard thing. In fact, there are people... I'm not much on the costumes. That, you know, They either look like the era of Star Trek they are, or they don't. <laughs> I think my favourite Star Trek uniforms are probably the mid-TNG to Deep Space Nine ones. Okay. Or the amazing red ones from the kind of... the, the, T, the uh, original series movies on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, kind, the, the, the kind of Horatio Hornblower looking sort of Napoleon... Napoleonic. Yep, yep. Although, one. my favourite piece of um, of um, Star Trek costuming ever is probably the amazing mission jackets with the huge collars. Oh, those are fantastic. Um, where they go to regular one space station, they creep around trying to figure out what's going on. Yes, indeed. <clears throat> so I feel like this is this is really where... This, this is one where the drama and the stakes are actually ramped up at a really good pace. Because mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the problems that you know, Star Trek generally has always had is a very, very slow pace. Yes. And that's not a problem that I have most of the time. But it was very dry and there wasn't really enough, oh no! Oh no. Ooh, fun fact. So when this explosion happens, you mm -hmm. get the burning away of the hull there. And then when you cut back... Now the interior armature frame, I think they, for that they used um... The dish of the Enterprise, the original series Enterprise, sorry, the um, uh, the the one in Search for Spock that blows up. They had kind of a wireframe skeleton. Oh, okay. That they that's that's what is revealed underneath the dish. Mm. Um. But yeah, holy shit, that's like a that's like a major thing to happen. Yeah. So one of the things that's um, not really explained anywhere in the show is that there are so there are supposed to be only six. Galaxy classes. Okay. Because they're so massive that they wouldn't have the resources to build more than those. Mm -hmm. um, so the Enterprise is one. One of them turns up on Deep Space Nine called the Odyssey. Um, 
the the Yamato is another one. Er, can't remember what the other ones are. Challenger, mm-hmm. I think there's one called the Challenger, which shows up in Voyager actually. Yes. So there actually have been uh, Galaxy class ships in all three series. I wonder where the. I wonder if all the other Galaxy classes are as much of a pleasure cruise as. Uh, oh sure, yeah. Enterprises. Well, the other thing is, some again, somewhere in the ancillary material, I think it might have been Andy Probert said this, but the notion of why the of why the Enterprise D is so big, it's not just because they, it's not you know, because you see those charts of all the ships lined yeah. up, yeah, oh no, it makes and they sense, keep getting bigger and bigger. It's not merely that; it's also that the Galaxy class ship was meant to be going on a much longer mission. It's yes. meant to be a 30-year mission. Yes, so you need to have, be able to supply people with you know, full hives. Right, so it's supposed to be essentially a self-sustaining city. Daycare. Yeah, it, it's got daycare, it's got, it's got you know... I hope the Yamato creepy didn't grade have school daycare. Teachers. Hmm? I hope the Yamato didn't have a daycare. Uh, <laughs> let's not think about that too much. Now... Ooh. One of the best ships in all sci-fi, I Beautiful. think, is the gorgeous Romulan Warbird, designed, again, by Andy Probert, um, who I think is one of the most significant Star Trek designers next to John Eves. Probert's certainly my favourite. Yeah. But, you know, Probert designed... He did design work on the Back to the Future car, the DeLorean. Oh, really? Kind of adding stuff to it, adding the time machine stuff to it. The Greebles. Yep. Uh, he did. He did. I think the helmets for the for the Cylons in Battlestar Galactica. Mm. He contributed to the to the motion picture Enterprise refit. This actress is really great. She turns up several times. Actually, she she turns up again as a Romulan, and I think she also, she's also a scientist in the episode First Contact, where Riker contacts this species that um, are just on the cusp of developing warp travel, mm-hmm. and so they kind of do a little bit of you know research beforehand type thing. She's in that episode. Mm, okay. She's kind of a staple, actually. I can't remember her name, but she's really, really good any time she turns up. Um, particularly as Romulan. She got that slightly cold... Oh, and she's the creepy housekeeper in um, Janeway's Turn of, Turn of the Screw Hollow novel. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, oh, creepy. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, Star Trek is kind of a revolving door of similar actors. You're like, ah, oh, it's that guy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, most sci fi's like that. I love when he does that, when he, mm-hmm. says, when he immediately hangs up. The card out. It's like, you do not get time to say anything. It seems weird. I always figured that not being able to file while cloaked was a treaty stipulation. Yes. And that if you can file while you're cloaked, it breaks a treaty. Mm-hmm. Because otherwise, technologically, that would be easy to overcome. Because they overcome it... I mean, I know it was written after this, but in the Undiscovered Country, they have a, a Romulan... Uh, sorry, a bird of prey, a Klingon bird of prey that can fire while cloaked. Mm-hmm. But clearly they ban that technology because that's a, that, w- that would allow you to have just fleets of ships... And yeah, and I don't. It could just suddenly attack you. It's one of the only things I could think of that would, you know, in a treaty in which the Federation agrees not to develop cloak technology. Mm. It's about the only thing I can think of that would incentivize them to give that up. Yeah. Because I don't think you would agree to give up the strategic advantage of cloak technology without the other side at least saying we won't, we will not fire while cloaked. Sure. Because otherwise you, you have essentially an arms race. And maybe that's what's led to the peace that has, has existed since, you know, uneasy peace at times, but it's existed essentially since the original series yeah. times to Next Generation. Over that whole period, um, there's essentially been a, a long-lasting peace, and maybe that maybe this is what allowed the universe to have this kind of stability. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a fun thing to think about. It is, I like it. So they're, they're um, considering that there might be a flaw with these new Galaxy class ships. Mm-hmm. And they say at one point, like, maybe we should have run these through a few more tests before we put them out in space. Oh, Troy. Troy has some good uses at this point in the series because they, they, they haven't yet got everybody fixed in Aspic mm-hmm. in, their, in their kind of character traits like Worf always being used 
to to make the warlike suggestion <laughs> that is going to be shot down. We should do a war. We must attack. Mm. No, Worf, we're not doing that. I like the idea that every time Picard said, the the few times he said, yes, I think we might have to, uh, Worf goes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Red Letter Media pointed out recently, there is an episode where somebody finally says yes to Worf. Yeah. And he goes, thank you. <laughs> it's quite funny. Just a pause of disbelief. It's a fun little toy. Again, we've got these captain's logs. I like captain's logs where you have to sort of figure out what went wrong. Mm-hmm. Like that's clearly the same set, isn't it? Where they, they, oh, yeah. they kind of added some black panels. panels to it. Sure. Maybe maybe Captain Varley really liked black paneling. Clearly, he clearly liked his wall panels on top of the fabric. That's the thing. Yeah. And remove some of the decorations. Again, that was probably shot in an afternoon. Now, has that been composited in, or is that actually a screen showing that footage? Because if it was done in camera, that's quite impressive for the time. I'm for assuming it was composited. Yeah, but it's kind of angled. Yeah. It's not like the view screen where it's it's all shot front on. Interesting. I mean, maybe they could digitally kind of angle it. You know? Yeah. That's one of the fun things. Several episodes, you do get the sense, it may be in this one or it may be in another episode, where they're having a tense negotiation over the view screen with the Romulans. Mm-hmm. And you see a side angle, and they're looking at each other like this. Kind Mm -hmm. of, you know, people listening can't see. But basically, Mm -hmm. what you see in the view screen isn't flat like a television. Mm -hmm. It's actually Mm three-dimensional. And and you can now see the guy from the the captain of the other ship at a different angle. Mm -hmm. So that implies that the view screen is not actually just a a, a TV screen. It's actually more like... It's it's a it's a, a VR effectively. Yeah. You're actually seeing um, two dimensional VR. Yeah. It has, I guess, parallax is what I'm that's saying. So like if you yeah. if you were to walk side to side, you'd actually see. It, oh, that's weird. I'm not sure I like that. Well, it see, it seems like it would ha- it would be very hard to conceal things on your bridge. Like <laughs> the time the time that what's her face is standing just off screen. Uh. There's like. Uh, <laughs> Like, who's, who's that over there? You just walk around and look <laughs> around the screen. Peek around the corner. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, does it look like there's another room through there? In which case, it would really, it'd be really weird if it was very zoomed in. Yes. You know? Indeed. Anyway, so stuff starts going wrong with the ship. Like, the doors don't open. <laughs> like, the heat just runs into the door. The thing is, those doors were done by people either side. Pulling and up, pulling and mm-hmm. shutting them. So I bet that happened all the time. The doors didn't open properly. Like there are some bloopers where like Worf walks into the toilet. <laughs> the actor just got used to walking into doors. Yeah. Yeah, those definitely look tight in the back. They do the uniforms. Yeah. They definitely did some improvements to the. Um, the look of the panels mm-hmm. because they, they look a little bit washed out in this era of Star Trek. They, they, they definitely kind of brightened them. Yeah. Because you have the kind of the green, it, it all has this kind of green blue tinge. Yeah. When it should be kind of bright yellow and, and kind of metallic grey or whatever kind of colours. Yamato. Yamato. So obviously Yamato is named after the Famous uh, Imperial Japanese naval warship. Indeed. World War Two. That's a fun thing, is also figuring out where the ships are named from. Mm-hmm. Um, occasionally they were named after things like pilots, or like, so the Grissom is named after Gus Grissom. Mm-hmm. Or, they did a lot um, of experimental mm-hmm. pilots, right? That's actually in Discovery, which I really like. Okay. Um, so Crossfield, is it Scott Crossfield? Anyway, um... Chuck Yeager, like there's a mm. Yeager class. Um, so they have all of the... Um, the idea being that these are experimental ships that, you know, are trying to break the warp barrier mm-hmm. or, 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 you know, getting, getting them faster and so on. This is a nice moment. <clears throat> it's one of Wesley's few nice moments early on. Right. 
Well, by this point, Wesley had become a more interesting character, and we've also gotten to the point where, as I was saying last time, TNG early on did not have a lot of character moments. It was just people going, we have to get the thing. <laughs> what we does have to this, do the thing. What is this kind of... This is some kind of... Uh, Subneutronic laser ray. <laughs> that you know, they're just kind of there to do plot exposition. Essentially. Yes. Um, do the plot. Whereas this is more, you know, there's there's an actual relationship. He's teaching him. Mm-hmm. You know. <clears throat> so essentially, the the Iconians invented the Stargate. Okay. Where yeah. you just there's a there's a a portal that you walk through and then you're on another world. Mm-hmm. You know. And they bring this, the Iconian portal back in an episode of Deep Space Nine. Oh, okay. Um, there's an episode of Deep Space Nine early on in the Dominion Wars where um, the Jem'Hadar have, have captured one and they're trying to get it to work. Mm-hmm. And they have to, they have to do a, a little secret mission to, to go and knock this thing out. Otherwise, the Jem'Hadar will be unstoppable, basically. Mm-hmm. Um which is a nice a nice callback. It is. To this episode. I like this. Yes, unlike more recent Star Treks, mm, yes. <clears throat> where constantly everybody is crying and being really unprofessional. No, oh, yes, this is um, a nice one to cut in with some of the new episodes. Well, quite. In fact, I, th- I think I've seen it done where uh. <laughs> but I like that too. He's saying, you know, it's it's not cold. He's not he's mm-hmm. not saying in a very militaristic, devoid way. Well, we're trained to not to feel sad. He's right. saying it's not easy, but we're trained to work through it. But you know, the day that we're not moved by it, mm-hmm. by it is the day we should probably stop. Right. You know, he's very clear. Look, this isn't easy, and no. in fact, it's crushing but you have to just figure out how to keep working through it mm-hmm. we don't have time right now we have a crisis situation yeah because yeah. otherwise all of the people you know twice as many people are gonna die mm-hmm. as already have you got to imagine that at some point in between the episodes maybe they ha- actually have like a memorial service or yeah of you got to imagine that maybe that's what goes on because you're not sure they refer to the idea that that you know the Enterprise D's mission was seven years long. Mm-hmm. As in, like, this is supposedly real time, but these are significant events in during each yes. month or something that happen. And then there's the rest of the time is sort of more banal work a day. Jazz concerts and yeah. performances. <laughs> everyone everyone going and having lunch at vegan restaurants and uh, doing a little bit of yoga. Yeah. Some fighting weird skeletal. feature sports. Yeah. yeah. Fighting skeletor. <laughs> very good, very good. Riding around on holographic horses, you know, all of that stuff. Le- learning about humanity, listening to five symphonies at once. <laughs> <laughs> Just like your data's doing. Oh, data. I mean, you know, the design of the bridge is quite radical for its time because it's so massive. It's, I mean, think about the fact that the original series bridge was fairly small compared to this, mm-hmm. and we didn't yet have the cavernous bridges of like Voyager is bloody enormous yes um, or Deep Space Nine that huge op set at which least that's all for a levels. whole station right but the Enterprise D I, I think I've read somewhere that they considered giving it two levels actually there was going to be an upper level and a lower level but they decided having people shouting orders up and down <laughs> to each other hey impulse power ray shields <laughs> what was that <laughs> she ah <laughs> divert thruster power uh, yeah, no, not the best tactical decision to have two levels. Ah, uh, we got a classic race against time. Also, also, every time you get shot and everything is flying, you're just going to have people soaring over the yeah. over the railings. Oh, yeah. Like, plopping down onto the bridge. You can believe if they built that, they would have done it. Oh, yeah. Of course, they would have had a stun. hundred percent. A big battle stun. I oh, mean, no. they did it in the, um, they did it in the warp core. Yes. 
True. A couple of times in Voyager, I mean. Yeah. Around that upper railing. Have people falling all over the place, you know. You you go, LeVar Burton. You you do your thing. I do like how they've done this, because it does show you that the, the turbo lifts do actually change direction. They must have dislodged the turbo lift and, like... Yeah, that was definitely on its side there. Right, they must have done something so they could shoot it up and down and whatever. I do like that he's kind of squishing his lip sideways, so it looks like it's like G force is yeah, reacting on his face. Good. Yeah, don't hang her out. Do it. I also I love the. There's several moments of that throughout TNG where Picard just does what his crew recommends. Right. Yeah. Because he trusts them. Like the. Um, Data going, sir, drop the shields. And he mm-hmm. goes, okay. Drop the shields. Like, I mean, by that point, they're, they're kind of dead if they do, dead if they don't. Type yeah, thing. but Picard shows many times that he trusts his, mm-hmm. his crew. It's kind of an interesting idea that I think for a 1980s audience may not have... Because I mean, most, pe- you know, most people now are fairly computer literate. Like, yeah. Maybe even have done some coding and stuff, but in 1987, nobody really knew how a computer worked. So you have Jordy explaining it. So you've got to find a way to... But even so, it's actually quite a convincing Mm -hmm. idea that an alien computer system would not be compatible. And so it's causing havoc. Which makes it go boom. It was good. There's like action sequences, and so the bit with the turbo lift. What I like about that, as I was saying, is is that mm. the you know it shows you that the turbo lifts actually move sideways and then upwards yes. and then sideways again because they're they're kind of on tracks that run around. It's they're they're, they're almost like a subway wouldn't it, train we, or something. In that case, wouldn't it make have made a hell of a lot more sense for them to be cube shaped like a standard elevator? Um. Sure, but you've. I suppose they wanted to make them as space efficient as possible. I guess I don't know. I mean, it's supposed to just look like an elevator, but it goes kind of yes, up, down, and sideways. Well, maybe they wanted to be able to turn. Mm-hmm. Oh, all right, I can see, I can see that. But that was in the original series. They have they have it goes <laughs> every time it changes direction. It shows you changing direction. It's kind of a clever little yeah. thing, you know. Oh, uh, we have Pulaski. Ah, uh, Doctor Pulaski. I have mixed feelings about Plasky. Yeah. Oh, there's the um, red and blue liquids, whatever those do. Yes. Oh, well, maybe that's just her. That's her Powerade. <laughs> there's Gatorade over there for anyone <laughs> that needs it. The red is Gatorade. The blue is Powerade. You know, keep hydrated. Again, the idea of them saying, you know, What's being angry a about a splint. Or not knowing what a splint was. Didn't Beverly Crusher fall in a hole in the previous season and they literally do a splint on her leg? Yeah. So, okay, that's silly. That's a bit silly. That guy's just a complete, you know... Yes. What's the opposite of a Luddite? It's like a, <laughs> you know... I think maybe after... after. <laughs> that's, that's a great little bit of... Now, you can't tell me that Data doesn't have emotions because he just... He reacted like a human would. Mm-hmm. He's like, oh, 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 shit. Oop, I shouldn't have done that. Uh, well, maybe after um, after this, Pulaski files a report mm. and requires that all uh, that uh, all Starfleet medical have to mm. take workshops about ancient Earth medicine. The thing is, it wouldn't make any sense that they don't because all the time they're going to be beaming down the planets and getting, you know... Stabbed through the yeah. back by you're a gigantic have, spear. You're like, still gonna have field medicine. Yeah. For away missions. Of course. And you're not gonna have your your fancy medical tricorder doohickeys to fix every situation. So you're gonna have to be able to make a damn splint. You know, it's like that that great episode of um, Voyager where they end up stuck trapped on that planet and the Kazon have stole the vo- stolen mm-hmm. Voyager. Mm-hmm. So they have to 
it's called basics because they're back to basics. Yep. They have to just find, find food, find, find water. Yep, yeah, find stuff to make fire. And I like that one because Janeway is immediately like, all right, this is what we got to do. Mm-hmm. She doesn't waste any time. It's just, look, we can figure out how to get the ship back after we know that we have our basic survival needs. Exactly, yeah. Priorities. The, and the training just kicks in. She just knows what to I do. I still think she's a brilliant captain. Oh, she is. I do really like... Um, the introduction of Khan Nini. Now, the triangular sideburns thing. Mm-hmm. That is an original series. That You see how he's got triangular yes, sideburns? they were all required to have that, weren't they? Somewhere, yes. Somewhere I actually have a little document that tells you the exact angle to shave everybody's <laughs> sideburns at. That's so, so funny. For the costume department. That's so, so all funny. the guys, except for, obviously, Riker. Handsome Riker, man. Even, even Crusher there. They've shaved whatever they can into a triangle. Now that is a proper 80s hairdo on the on the lieutenant at the back. Oh, yeah. That tactical. That kind of like very up. Shaved on the sides, but like very up on top. She kind of looks like a, a mind. She kind of looks like Mayday from, from View to a Kill. Oh, yeah. She kind of has like that, that Bond henchman <laughs> kind of look. The little ship's named Tenzin. Ah, yes. So clearly the Romulans have the same problem. and They're trying to fire at each other, but they can't. And this is another example of the tease that you never actually see a Romulan warbird and the Enterprise go at it mm. f- full on. Because mm-hmm. the whole point is that it's Cold War tensions. Yeah. And they never actually fight, but they could. Yes. If they could, you know, they could... Completely Both sides would be each screwed, other. yeah. Right. So they're more or less evenly matched. But they if they find another way out of it, which is very eighties, that's that's very it's kind of hunt for Red October or one of those one of those kind of situations where they have to kind of negotiate and and find another find a way to prevent um a conflagration. Yes. I love this. Entering the neutral zone for any reason is an act of war. And yet they constantly do it. Yeah. They're always in the neutral zone. I like how she's pretending that they've decided they're going to claim this planet when in reality they just, they're just stuck. Right. She just needs an excuse that makes her look strong. <laughs> well, that's the whole Romulan thing is they're, they're, they're very... They're posturing, but they're also they're always hiding something because they're always up to stuff. Oh yeah, they've always got shenanigans. I do like that. Pew pew. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful, all the fiber optic kind of windows along the edge. Mm-hmm. It's fantastic. It really gives it a sense of it being massive as well. Yeah. To be fair, I do kind of understand her frustration after trying to get Netflix to work. <laughs> I do like Troy there. She's very frustrated that her that her ship isn't working. Like, mm-hmm. thanks. Could have told you. Thanks, Troy. We don't know what we would have done without you. Try to keep the shields up. Uh, we'll figure that out when we get to it. We got some good solid rules that you can't you can't beam people back when you've got the shields up. Yes. Right. So you always have to find ways to lower the shields, and they don't cheat with that too much. It just no. kind of that's just the way it is. I I love sci-fi that follows its own rules. Mm-hmm. For me, as soon as you started breaking your own rules too many times, it just loses it loses interest. Yeah. Because yeah. you get into a situation and there's less tension because you, well, okay, they're gonna find some rule to break mm. to get out of it. It's the sonic screwdriver problem, isn't it? <laughs> it is. It is. Well, you know, at least the sonic screwdriver doesn't work on wood. Oh yeah. It does have one vice. <laughs> I do kind of like how the interior of the set, those kind of diamond-shaped windows, match the exterior shot mm-hmm. we just saw. 
Little details like that. It's really nice. It looks like the Aztec game. Yes. On the ships. So obviously for the Blu-ray, uh, you know, a lot of the exterior and the planet shots were redone because they were originally probably fairly low resolution, resolution map paintings that weren't... They probably rescanned them and then added extra things. But they kept it to the original style. Mm-hmm. So there's like a... In one episode, there's an interior of a Borg ship. And they've added quite a lot of fine detail. Like, they've added some extra smoke kind of rising and some, like, some Borgs walking around on the upper levels and stuff. But it's still the same shot. Mm-hmm. They've just added more detail to it so that it stands up to Blu-ray and us all having massive 60-inch screens and stuff, you know. Well, yes. There's a lot stating the obvious at this time. I mean, I feel I just feel like Troy's character wasn't really well thought through. No. Like she's there to advise the she's there to advise the captain on how the crew feels. It doesn't feel like that really I don't know what I'm trying to say, but it doesn't it doesn't really come into its own enough. No. I mean I She ends up just being a therapist, basically. Well, yeah, I kind of assume that's basically her role. She's just applied therapist. Mm-hmm. This moment isn't too bad where Obviously, she's saying the obvious. Everyone's very tense, but Riker says, "You know, okay. Well, what should we do about it?" And she at least is able to say, "Look, everyone on the ship is tense, and they're going to they're going to start making mistakes. So give them something to do. Keep them busy. Keep their mind off of it." Okay, yeah, fair. Like, that's a good suggestion of hers. Yeah, that's a good use of her. She, that that's a good use for that. You know, twenty second mm-hmm, mm-hmm. clip. But otherwise, them just saying, "I sense fear and anger." Like, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's not really giving us much, is it? No. Could have, could have told you that. It's like, she's also a beta, so I'd like, use that more. (laughs) (laughs) We've got a kind of a, a, like an Indiana Jones style, you know, We've we found the lair. We found the tomb where where all the secrets are hidden. It's that it's that yeah. type of an episode. I like how all of, with the exception of the uh, Romulan ship, all of the portals that or all the places that these portal goes mm-hmm. are on Earth. Hang on, where are we? And <laughs> he just fucking sticks his hand in there. Oh, sorry. Now I'm assuming you can change what the seven things that it's repeating between. I assume. You can change what those are, it's sort of just randomly selected. But again, they're cycling through a Romulan ship and cities on Earth. Yeah. What? I mean, I That's guess. That's obviously a map painting there. I guess they turned it pink so it doesn't look like Earth. Oops. Distant corners of the galaxy. Right. There you go. That's Babylon or something, isn't it? That well, castle. I'm not sure. Well, at least if you co- color correct everything within an inch, an inch of its life, it doesn't look like true. Anymore. True. That's one of my favorite tropes: is color correcting things within an inch of their lives. But yeah, that's every alien planet. Yeah. yeah. It's a quarry, but purple. <laughs> <laughs> You got that lovely texture paint they use on all of the, or anything you want to look metallic. Mm-hmm. Just use that texture paint, paint it kind of slightly silvery, and it looks like metal. Yep. When it's probably just yeah. Day labor. Day yeah. I still love picking out the moments where a bit of paper mache rock or iron beam falls on an actor and they have to pretend it's heavy. It's mm. one of my that's one of my favourite tropes in old yeah. sci fi is mm-hmm. actors pretending things are heavy. Wolf does that, he's like <laughs> and try to pick stuff up. <laughs> or you use data to do it and you just Yeah. Yeah. Here you go. The Enterprise. Which just seems to select things that are nearby. There you go. That's Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for that. Some of it's like a little bit cheap looking, the sets. 
A little yeah. bit, but it does get better. It does get better. Mm-hmm. The more on location they can do, the better. You've got like a stripper pole and <laughs> a, ba- a baseball, a plasma sphere, a plasma sphere, and a dog, a dog food bowl as well. Oh, poor Data. Data got zapped. He got zapped. I mean, it's a cool prop. Not, not this in the prop. I'm sure it turns up elsewhere. I mean, this is one of these things that you know you could spend ages figuring out where they reused all the props from, you know, different places. Oh yeah. Hmm. I was trying to rewrite data. I forgot about that. Yep. Like when he jerks his head around, you mm-hmm. can see his mullet kind of going. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I will say Brent Spiner is pretty good at acting like a broken robot. Oh, he's wonderful. Yeah, no, he, he, it's a very good. You know, it's very good. It's a it's a great performance. It's an iconic performance. You know? mm. Um, I mean, so many sci-fi androids have been based on him, basically. Yeah. That must be so difficult as an actor, though, to have to do a scene where, okay, you're not allowed to move, you're not allowed to yeah. breathe, you're not allowed to blink. It's like acting dead. Yeah. You know. But even less organic. Right. Well, Duncan Casey says he's done he's done dead acting a few times, and it's very, very hard. <laughs> the worst ones are when your eyes have to be open, I think. Oh, God. Because the temptation to blink must well, be... Well, yeah. yeah. They must... We can't imagine they'd load your eyes up with Ooh, props. I wonder if I recognise that that stuff. There is a type of... I used to work with this sometimes when I studied art, mm. actually. Is they, there's a type of foil card. It's got a layer of foil on it, mm-hmm. and then it's got black paint over the top that you can scratch off. Uh, I think oh, that's yeah. probably... And I used to do all kinds of little designs I used to play with that. that stuff as a kid. It looks really great when, mm. you, when you do it. You, you, you can do extremely fine lines and things. Uh, I wonder if that's what they used for the... That makes sense. Wall decoration behind them. <laughs> and one thing that's slightly not convi- convincing here, the probes are in Lodge Bay, and the backwash, they say the backwash from the rockets will, will set off a fire. Mm-hmm. There you go. The thing is, it's a blue plasma ball. Doesn't have any rockets. I think it just kind of warm. It just, it just kind of dis, you know. Maybe it has maybe some sort of levitation ability or something. But maybe it's like our uh, our space shuttles that have multiple segments that break off. True, but you know you, what you see is is a, a blue yeah. sphere of power. It seems much more advanced than that. It's just kind of levitates into the air. You know. See, I think of it more as like they're fired out of a giant gun, mm-hmm. and if you stop up the end of the gun. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's just one thing that seems a little bit. Oh yeah, they don't, they don't quite explain it right. Like that was clearly done before these were designed. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, that's that's a script thing. I like this. Is it three blues or is he ticking? <laughs> yeah, he's ticking. Oh dear. There we go, we've got the Parthenon or something, the Acropolis. Almost, it's not very precise, Worf. <laughs> yeah, Data, write down all the play, all the different Earth cities that he could show up in. Right. It is alright, I will be in Toronto on Earth. <laughs> <laughs> I've always up. wanted to visit. Pick me up next week. Yeah. <laughs> Brent Spider must have loved that. Oh, yeah. Actually, I think there's an outtake where he fluffs his line and Brent Spider's like, what? Stop, I need to get down. I need to get down like a cat. Yeah. Here you go. It's, he's, he, yeah, it's it's this scene. He gets angry with um, Riker. <laughs> he gets angry with Jonathan Frakes because he keeps messing up the line. <laughs> he's just walking <laughs> around like a doll. Oh, I love it. 
Uh, oh, we have to find that blooper later. I want to see oh, that. Oh, yeah, I'll find it for you. If you look, it's on the season two bloopers. They, they've they cropped up all over um, YouTube and stuff. Uh, for anybody listening. All four of you. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say two and a half. Yeah. I can't remember the design of the warp core change. I think it might have been motion picture when it became the kind of clean tube. Because in original series, the warp core was more just... It looked like a real engine, mm -hmm. you know? It was just this kind of, like, grated-off area with kind of lots of what looked like cylinders and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I do like the idea of it being this kind of vertical tube that's like a reactor, you know? There was a good uh, thank you Blu-ray moment back there mm. where Jordi uh, closes Data's eyes. Mm. You can see his eye twitching. Oh, yeah. Which I do always find it funny. Whenever you see in a show them do that thing, mm -hmm. it doesn't actually look like they're touching the person's face. It's kind of like they just pass their hand right. over the face. Hi, Data. But this gives them the idea of how to solve the virus problem. Yes. Just shut everything down and restart. Have you tried turning it off and back on again? <laughs> Literally, they turn it off and on again. Yeah. I mean, if kicking it doesn't work, that's the next best thing. You just got to reboot, turn it off, count to 15 Mississippi, <laughs> and turn it back on again. It's fine. So, you know, it's not, it's not a great ethical episode it's not a big sort of moral no. debate or anything like that star trek always gets kind of held up a little bit maybe too much as being a very cerebral or a, a show about ethics mm -hmm. and so on some of the best episodes are about ethics but there's also episodes like this which are basically just a really good thriller plot it's still nice and tense though yeah like there's a there's a problem that needs to be solved. Mm -hmm. The characters are mostly just... It's mostly about figuring out the problem. Yes. You know? Make it so. Aw, Tata. There you go. They turn it all off. You've got some ancient language here. I like how immediately everything yeah. starts shaking. this moment of, well okay gotta go somewhere better here than there <laughs> doesn't matter doesn't matter just beam up like <laughs> she immediately thinks he's done something yep what have you done? Something Seymour is the name of the actress. I mean, you just saw this happen to the Carrington. Yamato. Clearly it wasn't... I do like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. Bye. He said with a partially disassembled tongue. <laughs> Such a simple effect. Oh, yeah. It's just glitter in water being being spun around. I mean, that was so clever, but it works so well. Yeah, it's beautiful. That, that's what I like about the kind of inventiveness of some of the effects. Like, uh, the Mutara Nebula in Wrath of Khan is just some gel or wax or something being, being swirled around in a fish tank. Nice. Um, Isn't the Stargate they just shot into water? Yeah, I think fired it was, something into water. So the, yeah, what, what Annalise means is the the air, the kind of kawoosh yes. where the Stargate the, opens the and goes. Whoosh, 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 whoosh. That the kind of whoosh. um, they call it the unstable vortex. Mm -hmm. Um, I love that they kept that. Such an interesting idea for a wormhole. It doesn't just show up like it actually has this opening 
um, that looks so much like water. And then it, in the movie, it kind of trails back, actually, like it's spinning, like it's a little mm-hmm. water tornado. Mm-hmm. Um, but actually, what's uh, that's an air ram. I oh, think. okay. All right, cool. They, they actually shot air into water and filmed it at high speed. Cool. Well, there we are. Yeah, there you have it. Now, one of the things I really love about the ending there mm-hmm. is you have the two ships flying away, and because the, um, the bay on the surface... Is exploding. Mm-hmm. They have teeny little explosions going. <laughs> pow, pow, pow. <laughs> little mini explosions. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. Indeed. Um, we will be back for another one shortly. We will be. Which will be a bit of a contrast. Yes. Which will be nice. Um, so thank you for listening, and until next time. Goodbye. So long.